thanks so much for watching. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. Take care and come back. Matthew 24, verse 7, starting at verse 7. A nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences. Say pestilences. pestilences. We don't say this word a lot. I don't think we say this word at all normally. Famines, we know. Pestilences and earthquakes in diverse or different places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Just the beginning. What happens after the beginning? Verse 9. We don't like this. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. There are a lot of signs that we're moving towards the fulfillment of these scriptures. Even just the beginning of 2020, we've seen so many developments the Australian bushfire, we've seen some strange new virus called the coronavirus has infected people in China, over 1,300 people in China. 20 million people are in lockdown. They're in lockdown because you cannot even see the symptom of this for at least two weeks. So if you're a carrier of the virus, you have no symptom for two weeks. So then you can get on a plane and as Chinese New Year you know, coincides with January, and this is when the outbreak was, Man, that's the time when all the diseases can be transported in and out of China. So over 40 people have died from this. It's a strange new thing. They say it's related to SARS. Um, another strange thing is, you know, this Wuhan province happens to be the center of their, their research lab. They have a virology research lab. So, of course, this stokes a lot of fear and conspiracy theories. Are they engineering these viruses or were they studying something and then it got out? So, just so happens, their lab to study viruses is there. They've been studying SARS. Then you've also got, uh, on the 25th of January, 2020, the month is not even over, and you've got a 6.8 earthquake in eastern Turkey. 18 people already counted dead, 550 people injured. Uh, this is so powerful, it was felt as far as Tel Aviv in Israel. Lots of strange things are happening. Now, I want to say, first of all, that not all disasters and diseases are specific acts of judgment. In a sense, there are general judgments. In a sense, all these bad things are due to the fact that there is sin on the earth, there is a curse on the earth. We live, you know, with fallen, fallen man in a fallen world. And so not every bad thing is an act, a specific act of judgment against a specific sin. You could just have a bad day because we're just in a messed up world. Can you understand that? Yeah? And not every hachu and not every sneeze is, wow, that's a sign of God judging me. I want to be very clear about this because people sometimes, because their heart is so good and they want to receive the Word of God, they take it to an extreme. So other people are stubborn and won't even hear the Word of God, but I preach to the best of the best. Your heart is very tender. So I want to make sure you don't get to an extreme and think, I'm saying everything is a sign of judgment. Not at all. But I do believe that biblical justice is poetic. Biblical justice is poetic. The way that we should say it is biblical justice is prophetic, but the world doesn't understand that. But if you say poetic justice, everybody understands that. Let me define it for you. Poetic justice is the fact of experiencing a fitting or deserved retribution for one's action. We say that justice is poetic when vice is punished or virtue is rewarded without another party actively seeking to reward or punish. Another way that I say it is that justice, biblical justice, is symmetric. It's not random. Symmetric. It's almost like a mirror to the sower. You've sown something and it comes back 30, 60 to 100 fold. Justice, what we call justice, is simply the act of reaping, and it's a mirror to the sower. That's what I mean by biblical justice. I know that few people today, even within the church, are aware of the symmetric consequences of what they do. 
But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, I quote verse 38, If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. We are not trying to convince everybody, but those who are aware that God is alive, God is real, and there are consequences. There are consequences to what we do. And to those people I want to speak today, because I think you will see that the Bible makes sense. Biblical justice is poetic. It's prophetic. And it hits the sinner where it hurts the most, where it means something the most, with the intention to cause a humbling and a repenting. This is what is allowed to bring life. God is not a meanie. God is not trying to do bad things. But he does bring repentance because repentance leads to eternal life. So here are many, many, many examples in the Bible. We're just going to quote a few. Since we're in Exodus right now, everyone's life journaling. Everyone's doing your reading. Read the Bible through every year together. The Bible reading plan is at discover.org.au. So let's take some examples from the story of Exodus. If you worship a river, if you worship a river, how could God wake you up? God sends judgment on that river. He makes it stink. He makes it turn to blood. And, he, and many of the fish will die there. Well, this is exactly the first plague of Egypt against the Egyptian god of the Nile. And there were several of them. There was Apis, Isis, Kunum, Osiris. All these were gods associated with the river Nile. They said that was the source of life. And that's an affront to God. God is the source of life. The Nile is just a little, little catch basin for, for some water that he sends. But they glorified it. They deified it. And they said that the Nile was actually the very blood vein, the very vessel of the God of the underworld. And so God judged it within the first judgment. That's called poetic justice. And did you notice when you see the story, Pharaoh never complained and said, this is unfair. Because Pharaoh knew exactly why it had, it had happened. And God had given him nine chances before. So there was nothing unfair about it, and it read like poetry. They knew exactly what this was about because years before, perhaps we forgot about it. Maybe it was decades ago, and we say we have forgotten. But you know what? Justice never forgets. It seems long. It seems delayed. It seems to take a, long, a lot of time. But justice never forgets. We teach a lot about mercy and grace, but mercy and grace is, is predicated on an awareness of justice. Justice, let me define our terms. Justice is getting what you deserved. Justice is getting what you deserve. What do sinners deserve? Curses every day. Sickness, poverty every day. Misery every day. And when we finish our miserable lives, then hell awaits the sinner. Is God unjust? Not at all. That is perfect justice. If God did that to every sinner, he would be right. He would be just because of the sins that we have committed. We would pollute heaven. We would turn heaven. I always say you, just, you only need one sinner to turn heaven into hell. You only need one. You only need one terrorist to make everybody have to take off their belts and shoes and unpack their bags and can't carry water bottle. Only one terrorist did that, Osama bin Laden. And for 20... 30 years and on into the future, everybody suffers because of one sinner. You only need to let one sinner into heaven, and he will or she will turn it into hell. You'll have to lock your door in heaven. You don't know who's going to steal. You don't know who's going to, you know, rape your child. You don't know who's going to do something bad. You only need one. That's called justice. Now, we like mercy. Mercy is you don't get the punishment you deserve. Justice is you get what you deserve. Mercy is you don't get the punishment that you deserve. Why? Because somebody was punished for you. It's like you owe a fine, but somebody paid the fine for you. That's called mercy. And Jesus extends mercy because he's a just God. There is a real justice. Then grace is even beyond that. Grace is you get the good you don't deserve. You get the good that you don't deserve. A lot of people think, when I pray, I deserve the answer. No, you don't. No, you don't. Jesus deserves the answer, and that's why we pray in the name of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we get the answers. Because he deserves the answer, but not us. 
So punishment, uh, justice is getting the punishment you deserve. Mercy is you don't get the punishment you deserve. And grace is you get the good, the blessing that you did not deserve. All right, so in all of these acts of judgments in the book of Exodus, God was just. God was displaying his justice. And yet we have judgments that are in our faces, like Australian bushfire is pretty in your face. And nobody dares say that that might be a curse, not a blessing. It's not a blessing. But people are, are kind of nervous to preach the Bible because of the backlash, because of what we see people say when we try to say that, hey, maybe we need to repent. We're not trying to destroy your life by preaching this. We're trying to say, let's repent before it gets worse. Because the, the book of Revelation says it's going to get worse. You think one billion animals dead within a few weeks is bad? The Bible says in Revelation, in my book of Revelation, it says one-third, one-third of all animals, fish in the sea, grass, and trees will be destroyed before the second coming. So when do you think this is going to start? At some point, there's going to be a transition. And at some point, somebody has to preach poetic justice, that these things are not random, they're not chaotic, they relate to something, which is good news because if we know what the something is, we can then repent of that thing and God will heal our land. But we have a responsibility to repent of our own personal sins, but also of our national sins. And that's what would heal the land. But what about the New Testament, Pastor Steve? You're quoting Old Testament. Okay, I'll give you New Testament. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Is that New Testament? Are we in the age of grace? Sure are. Paul's preaching to Sergius Paulus. By the way, that's Paul preaching to Paul. Two guys named Paul together. And uh, this one is Sergius, so we know he's a Roman. He's an official who desired to hear the good news. He wanted somebody to tell him the truth. How do I get saved? But, the Bible says in verse 8, but Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them withstood them, opposed them, was annoying to them. Make sense? Withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Verse 10, and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, Thou enemy of all unrighteousness. Imagine you come to church and the pastor calls you, you child of the devil. Every Aussie would be offended and leave that church. They would know, this church would not grow, okay? Now this, this is Paul. This is the man that gave us the good news. How come we forget these things? Why are we trying to hide this aspect of the Bible? We love all of the Word of God. That's what makes us Christian. So he calls him a name. He says, you're an enemy of all, un, of all righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the ways, the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Now he, he blames the Lord, okay? Paul's blaming the Lord for what's about to happen. The hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. You see, Elimus wanted to mislead others. He wanted to prevent them from seeing the light. And so he went physically blind. Blindness was payment for keeping others in the dark. That's poetic justice. Why do we deny that this happens? In my 20 years of being a pastor, I have watched that when people accuse an innocent person, they get accused and they even get arrested. I've seen it. I've seen it within the past year. In the past year, I, I can count three people who falsely accused me. Some publicly, some behind my back. All three were arrested. Yeah, wow, it's right. It's undeniable. I quote the scripture. You want to know the scripture I like? I quote this one, when they're so unjust. Psalm chapter 3. Here's one about justice. Psalm chapter 3. I rested and I slept. 
I rested and I slept. Because when you're going through injustice, you refuse to let it go. You can't sleep at night. You think about what they said. You think, why did they say it? You think, why didn't they ask you? Why didn't they? Why can't I defend myself? Nope. Psalm chapter 3, verse 5. I rested and slept. I awoke, for the Lord protects me. I am not afraid of the multitude of people who attack me from all directions. Rise up, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Yes, you will strike all my enemies on the jaw, and you will break the teeth of of the wicked. Ouch. Ouch is right. Ouch is right. As long as my life is right with God, I can pray this. But if I am also worthy of judgment, if I am living in sin, if I'm doing something bad that I haven't repented of, you better not call down fire. Because you must stand in the fire you call down. So this is, should not be a surprise to anybody who's Bible literate. The Bible says in Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Psalms 105 says, Touch not my anointed, neither do my prophets any harm. These are scriptures that will be true forever and ever. They, they haven't stopped being true because we live in an in a independent culture, in a self-sufficient democracy. This word remains true. I would never dare touch a servant of God. I don't care what I know about them. I'm not touching them. Let God deal with them. In fact, when you're critical of a, of a pastor or a minister, my question always is, how much time did you spend praying? If you're critical of me, how much time did you spend praying for me? And without fail, they don't pray. They mouth off. Words are free. You might as well get on your knees and pray for them if you think they got a problem rather than gossiping about people that you don't really have a right to gossip about. I'm going to now tell you four types of poetic judgments. Here's a question. Do you believe in heaven? Various polls find that somewhere around 80% of Americans do. But a Harvard-trained brain surgeon wasn't so sure until he spent a week in a coma and came out with an incredible description of the afterlife. My co-anchor Terry Moran has a story. A mild afternoon in Lynchburg, Virginia, and Eben and Holly Alexander are at a high school soccer game cheering on their 14-year-old son, Bond. They are a perfectly ordinary American family with an extraordinary story. They have been touched by a medical miracle and maybe more. I mean, it was impossible after impossible after impossible. Eben Alexander, a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon who was a skeptic when it came to religion, survived a near-death experience, and he now carries the memory of what he says was a journey to heaven, a journey that all his scientific training cannot explain. On November 10th, 2008, Eben awoke with a searing headache. When his wife, Holly, checked in on him, he was having a tremendous seizure. And I said, say something, and he didn't say anything, so I called 911. Eben was rushed to the hospital, where he worked as a neurosurgeon. The only word we could truly make out was help, and the rest of his verbalization was purely uh, screaming. Eben Alexander had been stricken with an extremely rare and virulent E. coli meningitis infection that was ravaging his brain, plunging him into a coma. I mean, I was trying to die. In fact, doctors gave him almost no chance to live and told his family if he did survive, he'd be brain damaged for the rest of his life. His eyes were just off and cocked. <laughs> it was just like no one was there. Eben believes Holly is right. He wasn't there. Did you go to heaven? Yes. I mean, in, in every sense of the word, that's what my, what my experience showed me. His first recollection, he says, was being a speck of pure awareness in a dark and murky underworld. And then I was rescued by this beautiful spinning white light that had a, a melody, indescribably beautiful melody with it, that opened up into a bright valley. Just an incredible, rich, ultra-real world uh, 
of indescribable complexity. God was there, he says, and he encountered him through an orb of brilliant light. He soared on the wing of a butterfly with a beautiful young woman as his companion, and the young woman gave him a message to take back from heaven. You are loved, you are cherished, there's nothing you have to fear, there's nothing you can do wrong. It's a beautiful vision, but heaven? A lot of people are going to say, Doctor, it was a hallucination. Your brain got zapped by this disease, all the wires got crossed, and you saw a girl on a butterfly wing, and you were spinning up in a melody. I know this was not a hallucination, not a dream, not what we call a confabulation. I know that it really occurred, and I know it occurred outside of my brain. So basically... Uh, but how? How can he even suggest that, much less claim that his experience is proof of heaven, as he's called his new book? He showed us his brain scan. It wasn't leaving any part of my uh, cortex unaffected. So your conclusion is because all of this outer area, which is the higher functioning, was covered with the infection, what you experienced in the coma wasn't part of the brain. Right. Many neuroscientists are deeply skeptical of Eben's claims, arguing his brain must have produced his vision somehow, most likely as he came out of coma. But something else happened. After he recovered, Eben, who was adopted, saw a picture of a sister from his biological family who died years ago, a woman he never knew. And I knew who my guardian angel was on the butterfly wing. It was the most profound experience I've ever had in this life. Your sister, by birth, and from a family that you didn't know because you were adopted, who died several years ago, who you had never met, you saw while you were in coma. Yes. And that was the key. That explained everything. Oh, sounds good, that's for sure. Dinner time at the Alexander home. Come, Lord Jesus, Jesus our guest to be. They were not a particularly religious family before Eben's coma. He was a skeptic. Not anymore. This proves that our, our soul, our consciousness, our uh, spirit doesn't depend on the existence of the brain and body at all and easily is actually freed up to a much higher state of knowing when it's freed from this body. Chapter 12. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Wherever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as golds, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, 
and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The end of Ecclesiastes or the preacher.